Um, good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, let's just jump right into scripture this morning. If you have a Bible with you, or if there's some around the chairs randomly, um, turn with me to Luke chapter 9, uh, starting in verse 18. Let me get myself set up a second a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. There we go. So Luke chapter 9, verse 18 says, Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Eliza, Elijah. Eliza is my niece, that's what I said first. <laughs> <laughs> others say Elijah. Um, and others say one of the prophets that long ago has come back to life. But what about you? Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, God's Messiah. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word and thank you for this moment where we can hear you speaking to us. Lord, I ask that you speak through me and in spite of me this morning and let us all leave this place a little bit more the child you want us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. So I have to admit this morning that the idea for today's sermon um, was a little bit controversial in our staff meeting when we were talking about it. We were setting out this sermon series for Lent, talking about giving up things for Lent, and what if we, we, we went beyond chocolate or sweets or candy bars or something and asked what God really wanted us to give up for Lent. So this morning, we're going to look a little bit at giving up our expectations. And this kind of sparked a debate in our staff meeting. Does God really want us to give up our expectations? What if we have good expectations? You know, we can expect God to be faithful, to never leave us or forsake us. He promised us those things, so we can expect him to follow through on those promises. That's the kind of God that he is. But sometimes our expectations don't quite get it right. For example, I'm, I'm a very emotional decision maker. Every decision I make, whether it's big or small, ultimately just has to feel like the right thing. Um, that's true. I remember when I was in high school and I'd go prom dress shopping, <laughs> I would take home maybe three dresses and I'd hang them up for a while and I'd try them on and keep them around for a week and whatever the one made me feel more like I was going to prom, that's the one I would get and the other two would go back. I think it drove my mom crazy because she had to buy three prom dresses every time. <laughs> but it, it was an emotional thing to me. Um, and that's been true with big decisions and small decisions. Everything just has to feel right. And often I can give you logical things. When I chose college, I could tell you all the right reasons why I chose my college. But ultimately, Calvin College just felt like the right place for me to go. And that feeling of rightness, if I'm really honest, is um, kind of how I think God speaks to me. You know, if something just feels right in my bones, often, eventually, I, that's, that becomes the thing that I feel like God is calling me to. God doesn't call me to specific prom dresses, I don't think, but there are some bigger things that I felt that feeling of rightness about. But there's kind of a dark side to that, in that I can manipulate that very easily. Since my decisions are all so emotional, if I get really excited about something, it's really easy for me to just decide, well, that's what God has for me next because I'm excited about it. So we're going to go forward and assume that that's what God is doing. But sometimes that leads me to expect things of God that aren't really fair to expect of him. For example, earlier this week, I had this great idea for a partnership for Harvard Church I had some friends of mine over who are pastors in the area. They work with students at the University of Washington. And I had them over, and I kind of pitched them this idea of how we could partner. And it was, to me, the perfect thing that we could ever do to get some college students and graduate students and University of Washington staff to come join us and try some new things and worship. And I was really excited. So of course, God was excited too, right? And I expected that this conversation would go really well. And they'd come and say, that's a great idea. We've been thinking about the same thing. And instead, I had them over. And I pitched them my idea. And they said, huh, that's really interesting that you're thinking about that. We'll pray that someone comes along and wants to partner with you. <laughs> <laughs> And I, you know, I felt that door just kind of slam in my face. That wasn't what God had next for us at all. <laughs> and even though I was excited about it and it seemed like a good idea to me, it wasn't actually what I should have expected God to do. 
Just because I was on board doesn't mean that I could expect God to be on board, and I had to give up my expectations. There's that little Lent practice for me this week. I had to give up those expectations that God would just jump on board to an idea that I thought was great. In our passage this morning, and you can bet that the, one of the reasons Jesus asked that question is because he knew that he wasn't doing things quite the way the disciples expected. When he asked the question, I think Jesus kind of knew the answers he would get. And when he, when he asked the disciples, who do people say I am? They said, well, you must be Elijah or a prophet or maybe John the Baptist who had just died, come back to life. People knew there was something special about Jesus. He wasn't just your average guy walking around. But no way could he have been the Messiah to most people because he wasn't doing what they expected the Messiah to do. People of the time expected the Messiah to come as a warrior. People, the Israelites especially, in that time were stuck in the Roman Empire, and they were being crucified and beheaded and unfairly taxed, and life was just really rough and kind of gruesome for people in that time. And so the people of Israel expected that when the Messiah came, he would do what, the, what God did for them coming out of Egypt and coming out of Babylon and going into Jericho and into the land of Canaan. They expected him to come as a warrior who wins battles and who drives out their enemies. And instead, Jesus came and he preached peace and mercy, and he healed people, and he touched lepers, and he hung out with tax collectors and women and Samaritans and all these people that dignified men of that time would never have spent time with, especially not someone as powerful as the Messiah. It wasn't at all what they expected their Messiah to be, and here comes Jesus saying things like, blessed are the peacemakers and blessed are the weak. Not blessed are the mighty and the powerful who drive out those evil Romans. But interestingly, Peter got it. Even though the crowds were saying, you must be Elijah or a prophet, not the Messiah, but these cool people, Peter, even with all of his bumbling and his, his confusion, sometimes got it. And when Jesus says, well, who do you say I am? He was the first to speak up and say, you're the Messiah. You're the one that we've been waiting for. Peter was able to let go of his expectations. You can bet that Peter had all those same expectations as others did about who the Messiah would be and what kind of warrior and defender and battle winner the Messiah would be. But he could put that all aside because he loved Jesus and he could say, you are the Messiah. Even though you're doing these things I didn't expect, you are the Messiah. It's a great moment of faith. Interestingly, this question of who Jesus was had come up before. In Luke 7, just a couple of chapters before our passage this morning, um, John the Baptist asks an interesting question, too. Um, if you look in Luke 7 in your Bible, um, John the Baptist sends a couple of his disciples, his followers, to, to go to Jesus, and they ask this, are you the one who is to come, or are we to expect someone else? It was like he was kind of watching and going, I don't know that you're doing this right, Jesus. There must be someone else coming. This can't be the Messiah I've been preparing for in the desert this whole time. So he sends his disciples. Interestingly, he doesn't even ask him himself. He sends two of his followers to come and say, are you really the right guy, or should we wait for someone else? And Jesus answers in a very Jesus kind of way. And he says to his messengers, go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor, and blessed is anyone who doesn't stumble on account of me. Blessed is anyone who can let go of their expectations and see what I'm doing. He doesn't totally answer John's question. <laughs> he kind of points him to those things that maybe sparked John's question anyway. The dead are raised to life, the blind can see, people are healed. But that's his answer. I'm doing these things because I am the one who you've been waiting for. I am the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus wasn't doing what people expected. And the thing is, it's not that Israel's expectations were sinful or morally wrong or even unfounded. If you look at their history, they were kind of in line. If you were to read the story of Exodus in the book of Exodus in the Bible, 
He would see Jesus winning battles and sending plagues to Israel's enemies and delivering them in this really powerful, really cool kind of way with locusts and frogs coming out of the sky and all kinds of crazy stuff. That's what they were expecting from their Messiah because God had done it before. If you read how they're rescued out of Babylon or the story of Jericho where they walked around the, the city seven times and just yelled and the walls came down, that's the kind of thing they thought the Messiah would do. So it wasn't that they were really sinful or morally wrong. It's just that their expectations didn't match what God was doing now. They had their expectations. They had what they wanted. They, right, like me, had made their kind of emotional decision and decided this is what we're looking for. And it wasn't what God was up to. So it was up to the people to change their expectations. Or maybe a better way to say it is to allow God to shape their expectations instead of their own wants and desires and understandings. Sometimes our expectations just don't match up with what God is doing. That's true for me. That was true for Peter. That was true for the disciples. Sometimes it just doesn't match. And that's when we're called to let that shift and let God guide our expectations. It reminds me of a story in 1 Kings 19 when Elijah, not Eliza, my niece, uh, was waiting for God to pass by. Um, I have way too many things in this title. Um, so there, there's a story in 1 Kings 19, starting in verse 9, and it says, The word of the Lord came to Elijah and said, What are you doing here? And Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars, and they put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Haven't we all felt like that at times? I'm the only one left. And the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountains in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper, a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he worshiped. You can bet when Elijah was told that God was going to pass by, you can bet that he was waiting for something like an earth-shattering wind, a literally earth-shattering wind, or a huge fire, or an earthquake, something really powerful. But God, again, didn't match up with his expectations. He came in a gentle whisper. And if you think about it, it's pretty miraculous that Elijah even heard that whisper after all of this commotion and earthquakes and rock shattering. I don't know if I were there, if I would have recognized that that's where God was. I maybe would have been a little disappointed. There was this great earthquake and rocks were falling down and God wasn't there, so he must not really be showing up. But God didn't match the expectations. He came in a gentle whisper, in a still, small voice. Because that's what God was doing in that moment. And Elijah was called to shape his expectations to what God was doing. Sometimes our expectations just don't match God's activity, God's work in our lives. Sometimes we expect God to bless our good ideas or our good intentions. I know earlier this week, I sure did. <laughs> but sometimes that's just not what God is doing. Sometimes he will if we're in line with what he's doing in the world, if we're in line with his will. But sometimes he doesn't. He has something else in mind for us. And he calls us to let him shape our expectations. Sometimes we expect God maybe to match our efforts or give us participation trophies for the things that we do. Maybe if we just work harder or do more or spend more time in church or prayer, then God will work the way we want him to and we can expect the kind of things God will do. And sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes maybe we expect God to show up in particular ways in worship. If we have the right songs and the right tempo and the right keys, the right worship leader, the right preacher, the right things going on, then God will show up the way we expect him to. And sometimes he does. Sometimes he shows up in different ways. Sometimes we expect God to fix our relationships or our hurts or take away our doubts and our questions because that's the kind of God he is, right? And sometimes he does, and sometimes he doesn't. 
Sometimes I think our expectations of God have more to do with our own decisions and wants and desire for control than they do with God's actual work in the world and God's kingdom and God's glory in the world. In my emotional decision-making, sometimes I expect God to show up in particular ways because they're the ways that make me feel the best. Or they might make me look really good. Or they might give me some validation in an area where I'm kind of self-conscious. And so I expect God to do those things for me. And sometimes he does, and sometimes he doesn't. But maybe it's my expectations that are the problem, not God's activity in my life or in the world around us. The disciples and others around Jesus, thinking that Jesus wasn't the Messiah, he was Elijah or a prophet or John the Baptist coming back, that had more to do with their wants for the Messiah than what God was actually doing in Jesus and his life and ministry. They wanted a Messiah to come and bust them out of their terrible situation, and God sent a Messiah to bring peace in a different kind of way. Here's the thing. So in all of our wants and expectations, if we're just waiting for God to act how we want him to act, we run the risk of missing out on what God is really doing. If Elijah, sitting on the mountain, had just waited for an earthquake or a fire, he would have missed that gentle whisper, that still small voice. If we spend our time shaping our expectations only on our wants and our needs, we might miss all of what God is doing around us, and what a terrible tragedy that would be for us. So maybe the charge for us this Lent isn't so much giving up our expectations, but seeking to let God guide our expectations, rather than letting our expectations guide God. Maybe it's letting God be in charge of what we expect him to do, or maybe we should just expect to be surprised by God in our lives. Either way, I think it takes a lot of courage to let our expectations be changed by God or to let ourselves be surprised by God's work in our world. That takes a lot of courage and takes a lot of letting go of control, letting go and letting God, as the saying goes. So this week, or maybe in these last couple of weeks of Lent, that's my prayer that God will shape my expectations of my own life and my own neighborhood, my city, my world, that I can let God shape what I expect, that I won't do what I did earlier this week and come up with a great idea for God to do. (laughs) I'll let him him guide me. I hope you'll join me in that prayer as we head towards Easter this year, because then we won't miss out on what God's up to. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that you are the one that shapes our expectations, that you are the one that's, that's really in charge of how you're working in the world, not me, not us at Harbor Church. And Lord, we ask that you give us the courage to follow you in real radical ways as we head towards Easter. In your name we pray. Amen.